I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, he's a former criminal turned politician. What's new about that? It seems like so many politicians are criminals, you might say. Well, this is a little bit different. Matt Raisi has a pretty interesting background. He was a former mob enforcer at one point before he turned state evidence and worked with the prosecution, and that put him on a path to turn his life around. We are delighted to have Matt on the show today. He used to be known as Matty the Madman, but now he is Matthew Razzi, candidate for president of the United States. Matt, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan, for having me. It's a pleasure. You have had quite a journey in your life. Let's start with the beginning. Let's go back. Tell folks what you went through with your life growing up in Michigan, then finding yourselves on the, yourself on the streets of New York, and then winding up affiliated with the mob. Let's start from that point when you started working with the mafia. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, basically, what ended up happening is I came from a broken home. Uh, my father was incredibly abusive and eventually sent me out to live with my mother in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, whatever, for whatever reason, she decided to leave me there. And eventually, I became introduced to a couple of different people that introduced me to more people in New York, hmm. um, where I essentially ended up in the long run and uh, met my former employer. And gotcha. just kind of uh, took off from there. And before I knew it, at 14 years old, I was driving a car for a mob boss. I didn't even have a license yet. <laughs> so, I guess it didn't matter to the mob boss, right? He's no, breaking he, a lot he of laws. Like, yeah, that was the least of his concern. So, you know. Exactly. So at one point, there was a sting operation. You got caught up in it. Tell me about that. Uh, there was some weapons trafficking involved. Um, basically, what ended up happening was you know, they always say that the bullet that gets you is the one you hear coming. Hmm. And that's kind of how, how it was with me that day. There were a couple of different signs that we were being watched by the feds. And uh, I didn't take notice quick enough. And the next thing I know, the, the front door of the club, the back door of the club, they're being knocked open by the FBI. And it was all over. That's all she wrote. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, you worked with the prosecution, apparently. You were able to cut a deal, so you did little jail time, no jail time. Tell me about that. Uh, about three hours, actually, <laughs> is what they pretty yeah, Once they got me processed, they kicked me free, and they turned me over to my handlers. That was gotcha. pretty much as long as I spent there. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was, I believe, 27. Okay. Yeah, okay. so fairly yeah. young. Now, how come you didn't get whacked? How come you're not in witness protection and all that stuff? Basically, what ended up happening was that the people that were working with me, they got busted for the same thing. We all went down at the same time. It was a multi-state sting operation. They weren't taking any chances. Gotcha, gotcha. But sometimes working with the prosecution and turning state's evidence has repercussions, but you were able to avoid that somehow? I stayed out of the public eye for about 10 years. I was actually instructed by my handlers to leave the state. Um, I'm fairly bullheaded. I wasn't going to run. I just figured it happens, it happens, you know, and thank God it didn't. So, Absolutely. And let me ask you one more question as, as we talk about your criminal past. Um, what did you do as an enforcer? Were you beating people up? Were you killing people? Tell me a little bit yeah, about we, that. Yeah, we were beating people up. That was, that was generally my, uh, my line of work, my, my uh, specialty, I guess you could say. Um, if somebody owed somebody money, if somebody got a hand in, in the side of the family, um, we're, you know, talking trash about somebody, they would, they would send me in my associates. Gotcha. Gotcha. And did getting busted help you turn your life around at that point? Did you say enough with this? Um, you know, honestly, it was more of my daughter. She's kind of the one that turned me around. She actually went to, to medical school and, um, you know, she helped me see that I needed to, I needed to do better. So, absolutely, absolutely. Now, why have you decided to run for president of the United States? Uh, well, funnily enough, my girlfriend Brenda Elkin is the one that originally pushed me into it um, because she always said I had great potential. And the more I started looking at our government and noticing what was going on, I just I wouldn't be able to sleep right at night if I didn't try to do something. So. 
Do you see yourself as a conservative, a liberal, middle of the road? Tell us a little bit about your Republican, political beliefs. Um, but I'm more of a liberal Republican. I believe that everybody should have the same rights. Everybody should treat, be treated fairly. Um, you know, once I get into office, things are going to change. I'm going to try to actually kind of group everybody together. I don't want people thinking that they're alienated. I think that's one of the biggest problems we have in our government is you've got one set of you know people that think they're the better than the other ones and another one's trying to push another agenda and we just don't get anything done. So we're extremely polarized right now. You have people yeah. on the right who hate the left and people on the left who hate the right and they really can agree on nothing. But yeah. there has to be common ground, don't you think? Oh yes, of course. Uh, you know, a house cannot stand when it's divided. So that's what I'm going to try to fix. Absolutely. What do you see as the most crucial or critical issues? Right now, I believe that immigration control, uh, education system, and, uh, you know, refunding the police. I think those are our, our biggest problems at this point. Absolutely. So. Now, let me ask you about former President Trump, because he is likely the nominee or will be a front runner, of course, for the uh, candidacy from his party. What What's your take on Trump? Good guy, bad guy, indifferent? You know, I come from a background that you only speak once and you don't tell people your plans, whatever they, whatever they may be, whatever they may not be. And I've always believed in, you know, you speak little and, and carry a big stick. And that's basically one of the reasons I don't respect him. He runs his mouth about everything. Mm. And I don't believe that's a good leader. I believe a good leader can, you know, do things that he doesn't need to tell other people about. And um, I've been in that position for quite a while. And I never ran my mouth. Absolutely. So some of the lessons you learned working for the mob, which is basically an organization, some would say a well-run organization, has given you lessons that you'd like to actually bring into your administration. Yeah. And, and in a way, our government has been turned into a, an organized crime. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much an outfit that's designed to make money. And if you want the mob run right, you bring in a, a mob boss, and in this case, an ex-mob. And uh, I'll get it done. Yeah. Let me get your thoughts on uh, the current president, Joe Biden. Um, I don't think he's mentally equipped. Mm -hmm. I don't know the man personally. Um, I'm not really fond of his policies. I don't know who has been instructing him. But in my personal opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, I think his, his administration has been a complete disaster from pretty much day one. Yeah, I think uh, we see that with the recession. We see that with inflation. We see that with up to four or five million people flooding the country. I mean, that's the size of many states, substantial states. I mean, yeah. how long can we go on having our border open to anybody who just wants to come across? We can't. Without a border, we have no country. And that's what people don't understand. We, we, we are a country of immigrants. Let me just make that clear. But at the same time, there has to be a process. There has right. to be a legal way of doing this. And right now, we have no idea where those, those millions of people are. We just completely lost track of them. And the ones that we do bring over here, we literally have no plan for. So they just sit in these detention centers, why we pay for it and why they suffer. So Absolutely. there's, you know, there's got to be some type of, of revamping. Exactly. We can be a compassionate country. You know, my ancestors came here from Ireland and Italy. I'm sure your ancestors came from somewhere in Europe as well. And, uh, you know, we didn't just walk in, you know, we had, there was a process of emigration and there needs to be that again, whether it's going through Ellis Island and being processed or, uh, or whatever. I see another big issue in the campaign. It, it has to be addressed because it's largely ignored. And that is the drug issue in this country right now. With I know so many people who have lost a loved one because of these opioid addictions. What's your plan for that, Matt? Well, first off, we need to figure out where these are coming from. That's, you know, once we find the source, we can stop it. You know, busting drug dealers, that's fine and dandy, but we need to figure out what the source is, whether it's the United States, whether it's Mexico, whether it's Canada, you know, it could even be China. I, I was doing some reading the other day and I found out that a lot of the fentanyl 
actually comes from the pharmaceutical group in Beijing. And, you know, there's a Foreign Substances Act, and we're not applying it. You know, there, there should be some regulation to these drugs that are crossing the border, because they're literally coming across the border at $100 million at a time. And we're not stopping. It, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Exactly. And, you know, when there was a huge problem with drugs in the United States in the 1970s, Richard Nixon declared war on drugs. I mean, right. what's the holdup? Why isn't that happening now? It's the administration. Everybody's got their hand in the, in the pot. Nobody wants to actually do anything. The money's there. The way we're going about this is completely wrong. We need to figure out where the source is and then stop them. And if it's another country, we can hit them with sanctions. We can force them to stop. You know, we talked a little bit about China before. China right now is completely oppressing its people with unbearable and unlivable and unconscionable COVID restrictions to the point where people are rising up, even though they know if they get arrested, they're going to just disappear. I mean, how can we be standing by while people in China are crying out for help without at least lending them our voice? Well, I think lending a voice is one thing, but I don't believe that we should continue to give money to foreign governments that, you know, at one point, number one, we're our adversaries. And number two, we've had a serious problem with them when it comes down to trade and other aspects. And it's like, I'm not willing to work with anybody that's not willing to work with me. If you're willing to meet me halfway, I'll meet you halfway, you know? Absolutely. Matt, let me ask you a little bit about some questions that voters might have, some concerns that voters might have. Some people are going to say, hey, you were a criminal. You worked for the mob. You beat people up for a living. How can we trust you? We have thugs in government right now, and they're not doing any better of a job. And the way I look at it is, you know, I was good at my job. I did what I was told to do, when I was told to do it, how I was told to do it. And there are secrets I still have, I'll take to my grave. So that right there shows loyalty. And that means, you know, with that, I got integrity. And again, that's a lot better than most politicians have that are in office currently. So, you know. Absolutely. And also your story sounds like a redemption story that you were lost, but now you're found. And I think that's kind of the American way. That's the Christian spirit that people do make mistakes in this life, that they will wind up on the wrong path. And it is a journey and it doesn't matter where we start. It matters where we end. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I so got me, really lucky. Go so, you know. I'm sorry, Matt, go ahead. Up. What's that? Go ahead. You were saying something. I stepped on you. No, I, I was just, you know, I was remembering a, a, a story that my girlfriend told me not long ago, that everything in my life has led me up to this point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's really the true redemption of this, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. The lessons we learn in life, the mistakes we make in life, the beatings we get literally and figuratively form the person that we are today. And I don't know anybody who hasn't lived over the age of 30 or 40 who hasn't made some big mistakes in the course of their life. Tell me how you proceed now with your political campaign, Matt. Um, I'm going to start hitting it hard and heavy in a few weeks. Um, I'm going to have a, you know, uh, basically my first public speaking in about six weeks. So that should be interesting. Um, and I'm just going to do whatever I can do to help the little guy. I want people to know that I'm actually here for them. And I'm not going to tell them just what they, what they want to hear to get their vote. Because if I did that, I'd really be no different than any politician is. So... Absolutely. Well, you are definitely caught cut from a different cloth, and that very well may be a good thing or a great thing. Matt Raisi is running for the presidency of the United States. He seeks the candidacy for the Republican Party. Uh, you can find out more about him and his campaign in the links below this interview. And we are delighted to have Matt Raisi on our show today. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Logan. It's my pleasure. And I'm Logan Crawford to the folks at home, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time, on Spotlight.